Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Spoiler Warning Podcast. This is a special bonus review where we're talking about uh, a San Francisco Film Festival 2021 uh, review of Naked Singularity. I'm Christopher Schneezy. And I'm Stephen Miller. And if you're joining us for the first time, the Spoiler Warning Podcast is a weekly film review program. Each week on the show, we're going to dive in, debate, discuss, and argue over the latest films coming to a streaming platform near you um, this week. This could be coming to a streaming platform near everyone, I guess. I, I, I think that the festival is region locked to the United States, but I don't think there's any issues with uh, hopping on board and buying a pass and checking out yeah. the films, um, which is something we did. But I think we, we took it a little easy this time. We just we just popped in, picked the two images that had well-known <laughs> actors in the photo and said, you know what? We don't got to do all the movies like we've been doing. <laughs> yeah. So, so I know I only watched two. Did you also only watch two? I only watched the two that we had kind of like talked about before. So this film, Naked Singularity, and also a film called The Dry, which is the inter- an international film um, from Australia. It is still kind of funny in my head every time that like I click on the international thing, I just expect it to be non-English speaking. Um, so right. it's always it always throws me for a loop where I'm like, this is an international. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah Australia. OK, cool. Gotcha. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're going to talk about Naked Singularity. Um, I haven't actually checked to see if there's a trailer, um, so I don't know if we're going to have that playing a little bit later. Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. Um, but to start off, Stephen, I have a question for you. You can decide whether or not it's a loaded question. <laughs> hmm. But my question for you, Stephen, is what do you think the genre of this film is? Interesting. I I think this film best approximates the heist genre. I think it. there are periods of this movie that feel very Soderbergh, um, maybe with like a hint of like Goodfellas or something, too. I don't know. I, I, I felt like the closest genre was heist movie. Oh, yeah. that, that seemed like what it was playing with. What, gotcha. what about you? Yeah, so I, I guess <laughs> my question wasn't loaded enough. <laughs> um, obviously, there is a very, very slight hint where this film wants to play in the sci-fi genre, I guess. Um, oh, which is, I see. Yeah. <laughs> and also, like, I guess I'm going to phrase the question this way. Do you think this is a serious film or do you think it is supposed to be a comedy? <sighs> I think this is walking the line in a what what's like a good comparison? I, I think this is mostly trying to be not non serious but playing with some serious like social messages, but in a kind of zany way. That gotcha. That, that's the sense that I got. Because <laughs> there, in, in my in my mind, when I was watching this film, I had there's there, there's a story about a little film. Have you seen the film Suicide Kings? Mm-mm. All right. So th- this story might be apocryphal, um, but for some reason, it kicks around in the back of my mind of the story that I've always heard that the film Suicide Kings was meant to be a a serious heist film. <laughs> Like it was a film about a bunch of guys kidnapping a mob boss in order to try to get money money to pay the ransom for one of the character's sisters having been kidnapped. Um, but things go wildly wrong for the group, and it's all about them trying just to not get killed as they're in way over their head. Now, yeah. this this story, which admittedly might be apocryphal, was that this film was supposed to be very serious and like a legit cool movie. And then once they completed it, they realized that it was people didn't take it seriously and it was kind of funny. And then they like recut the trailer and threw some crazy zany music over the top of it and then release it as like this wild, crazy comedy about these guys who get way too over their head. (laughs) And there was definitely at points in this film where I was like, is this basically suicide Kings? (laughs) Like not story wise, (laughs) but it felt like this film, like this film is definitely not serious. Right. I'm, (laughs) I'm I I mean, I think Bill Skarsgård alone makes it clear that the film isn't, like intending to be ultra serious yeah yeah <laughs> like, like like i don't know like like a comp it, it might be a weird comp but like sorry to bother you is something that came to mind where it, like it has a bite to it but scene to scene it is also playing with a lot of kind of comic energy or at least like you know high octane energy so yeah. i, I kind of felt like it had that combination where there are definitely things that are meant to be taken seriously but there is a lot about the tone that is also meant to 
kind of feel like a lot, you know, like, like feel very energetic. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, one last question then, Stephen. Uh, both this film, the Naked Singular or Naked Singularity, and the next film, The Dry, are both based on books. Have you <laughs> happened to have read this book? <laughs> no, I, I haven't heard of either book. Okay, cool. Neither have I. I just wanted to get that out of the way um, because I think, especially with this film, there's definitely things that clearly come directly from the book, um, which yeah. There was no attempt at all to not include them in the film. And it's definitely something that we'll have to talk about in spoilers and talk about uh, whether we think it works or not. Um, I, I guess some yeah. of it can be outside of spoilers. But anyways, what do you say, Stephen? I stop asking you random questions and we get into this review. <laughs> Let's do it. All right, Stephen. Um, don't think there's a trailer for this one that we can play. So we're just going to jump into the review. Um, Naked Singularity is about a man who is a public defender. And, uh, you know, he's kind of down on his job because, you know, he's getting screwed over in the court. The system is bad. Um, he really hates uh, the way the people that he tries to defend to get thrown through the system. And he's kind of looking for a way to change his circumstances. And one of his... Uh, I guess clients, uh, one of the people that he's defended in the past finds herself in a situation involving some a drug deal and stuff. And he and his buddy realize that they could get rich quick <laughs> by inserting themselves in this wild scheme that is happening. And uh, it's sort of about uh, that that play that they have going. So, Stephen Miller, what did you think of Naked Singularity? I thought this movie was very interesting as a festival film and what i mean by that is it definitely has a lot of the downsides that i feel when you watch like a kind of smaller festival release um i didn't actually check if this is chase palmer's directorial debut but it feels a lot like a debut um in that it it has like a it wants to say so many things, and I think the script is very, very messy uh, for that reason. L like, I, I feel like this movie doesn't always know what it wants to communicate. It feels like it's juggling, like, five ideas at once. Yeah. It definitely is one of those movies that has a tendency to have characters just, like, shout the themes of the movie at each other, you know, like, in a, in a very direct, like, this is what the movie means, this is the metaphor we're talking about way. Um and for that reason, I was inclined to kind of like, you know, ignore it or feel a little bit like not too into it. But the the two things this movie really has going for it. One is a killer cast. Like the cast is stacked. I mean, that that's why we watched it. Right. Like you've got John Boyega, yeah. you've got Olivia Cook doing this like amazing New York -y accent <laughs> that I had no idea she was able to do. Um <laughs> Tim Blake Nelson as like some like wild hippie physicist dude. Um, Bill Skarsgård, I don't know what movie he's in, but he's definitely there and he's doing something. Um, like like the movie just has this cast that you want to watch, uh, and and that speaks for a lot. And the second thing this movie has, I think, is a very real kind of addictive energy to it. Like the, this movie feels like like the. It, it plays with the confidence of someone who has been doing this their whole life, even when scene to scene, it doesn't make sense. Like it does it so confidently. Like, I, I don't know how to explain it. Like the moment the movie opened, it's just immediately in this like high energy, like, boom, let me tell you what we're talking about. Um, frame of being. And it, it, it like, it carried me through what I think is a relatively weak script. Um, it, I, I think it, compensated for the problems it had just by like sheer force of charisma and filmmaking energy. Um, I think this movie opens strong and it closes real strong. And there is like a pretty big lull in the middle where the story kind of loses me and I don't really know what it is trying to do. Um, but I was happy to be there. Like, I, I don't know. I, I was happy to be in New York, happy to see all these people. I think John Boyega is great as like the leading man here. It, it'd be really interesting to compare this to Red, White, and Blue, the uh, Steve McQueen short. I don't know if that was one of the ones that you caught or not in the... That, that was the one apps. I didn't see. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, well, in Red, White, and Blue, um, then John Boyega 
plays a person who enters the police academy and ultimately becomes disillusioned with the ability to make change from within and then, you know, thinks about leaving. And so I feel like that is a very somber movie about a very somber thing. This movie does not take it somberly, but it treats the justice system in a very similar way. I feel like they'd be a kind of fun, like, pairing to watch just to see the different types of John Boyega that you get. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I thought there were parts that like didn't work for me at all like there are romantic scenes that i don't think fit at all in the film um there are scenes involving <laughs> a judge that are very heightened that are trying to express a what i felt was kind of like an obvious social like obvious problem with the justice system but it was so exaggerated it it bordered on pure comedy but then it felt like it kind of didn't want it to be taken comedically there were some things where i don't think it stuck the landing yeah. but i like i did have a grin on my face just watching this movie and i was just happy with how much ridiculous energy it packed into the short run time so i it, it felt like a great little festival movie to me where it's like somebody really went for it they got a cast that was super game olivia cook's doing a ridiculous accent i'm i'm here <laughs> for it uh, you know good on you for sticking to your guns maybe try to write a better script next time <laughs> yeah um so the the energy that you talk about this film having i definitely felt it like as this film was starting like there is this song they repeatedly use anytime john boyega is walking to court where it just ha it's mm -hmm. like it's walking music right but it's like walking like tempo i got a place to go like it's like oh yeah he's gonna go in and kick somebody's ass in this courtroom like this is gonna be great like it has it has a like a swagger to the feeling of him coming into the courtroom. Um, and and, and I, I, as it started, I was like, all right, let's see where this is going to go. Like, I'm, I'm kind of interested in this. Um, but I think that, like, for me, that sort of went down really quickly as I watched the film, just because it was playing in too many genres and was juggling too many plot lines. And I never really felt like the characters had a good plan <laughs> like, yeah. or knew what they were getting into. <laughs> <laughs> Were you going to jump in? Oh, well, I, I was just going to say, like, you, you mentioned their plan in the synopsis. And to me, the, I don't even know, like, the idea of them even having a plan, I feel like that comes, like, like almost at the end of the movie. Like, it, it, it is a very kind of scattershot narrative that it's trying to tell. Yeah, like, 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 like one of the reasons why I want to have a spoiler segment is so that I can actually complain about something. <laughs> which I can't really do unless I can actually say what's going on. But let's just say that like the plan they're coming up with, there is, there is not like this film plays around with the idea of chances of things happening. Right. I'll say that for now. Mm -hmm. And of all the possible chances of something happening, there was zero chance that their plan would or should work out right like there's nothing about what they were planning to do and it was like i'm watching the film going like what is your literal plan and what information are you using to decide that plan this makes no fucking sense and like i couldn't i couldn't get behind the action of what they were doing because it didn't make sense <laughs> what they were doing or how they just willy-nilly talk in public spaces yelling at each other about this plan yeah. about how they're gonna rob people <laughs> like like it just it didn't really seem to make sense. But all that I could forgive and go like, you know what? This, this is fine. This is a little fun little festival film. Like, you know, it's a fun little heist movie, as you said. Like, I could, I could kind of get behind that. But I really, really, really hate the whole wrapper that this film sits in and how oh, that you works. Oh, don't, you don't like the little hints of sci-fi? I don't like the naked singularity. <laughs> um, I, like, I, the entire conceit of what this film is trying to do and the whole the whole visual play of like three days before the collapse, uh, two days before the collapse, three hours before the collapse, like all this shit, like it doesn't mean anything. It It's literally all leading up to one line, which I joked to you before we started recording <laughs> that one character says to another. And it really makes no fucking sense. And I, I really disliked it even existing in this film. Like, I think this film would be far better. Like, I understand that that had to come from the book. There's no way somebody tried to adapt a book and added that as a wrapper to right. this thing. Like, like that would be the, the most ridiculous idea in the world. Um, so, like, for me, I just, the whole time, every time it came up, I was like, this is going to lead to literally nothing. And, like, every time John Boyega looks up and goes like, 
whoa, that temperature sign says 150 degrees. Am I the only one that realizes it's not 150 degrees? Like every time it talked about any of that or um, the guy that you reference, uh, Tim Blake, Tim Blake Nelson? Nelson. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like every time you went to, to talk to him, I was like, no, like I would watch the movie about that guy and you interacting with him and something actually happening. But I know this film is doing nothing with it and it's going to lead nowhere. And it just sort of... it. <laughs> I, I couldn't, every time those titles came up, I was like, there's no collapse. Nothing is going to happen. And if this just turns out to be a stupid metaphor for like a plan collapsing, I'm going to be really pissed. And that's not really what it is. So I'm not spoiling the film, but like, it just like the idea of whatever it's trying to do did not work for me. And it, and it took me out of the film completely. And then because I was already out of the film, Anytime it was it was it was threading that line between like I'm trying to do a serious uh, take on the justice system mixed with like, but isn't this funny, though? And then like the way they edit dialogue, the way that like Edgar Wright edits video, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. it just it, it this film, it, I just I could I couldn't get into it. And while I had fun with with different scenes, like. You know, like their equivalent of you got to think a little bit bigger, darling, <laughs> like like that. Those there there were moments in the film that I laugh at, right? But also, I just don't. I it just it didn't it didn't work for me on any level, and it was sad. Into like like to me, the adrenaline of the movie just carried it so much, and I, like I get what you're saying. We, we can talk about it in spoilers. I think a helpful way to view this movie is to remember that John Boyega's character has barely slept in a long time. And I see what what you are seeing as a sci-fi rapper, I am mostly seeing as like the gonzo energy of a person who is, you know, extremely tired, but is staying awake and is like trying to accomplish a thing that he doesn't even fully understand. And it felt like a like leaving Las Vegas type or feel loathing in Las Vegas or something type of thing where it's like not. I, I, I don't know it honestly it felt and i don't know if the name is a reference it felt like naked lunch is like a book from the kind of like counterculture era where it, it just goes off the rails and like there is vague sci-fi but what it really is is a guy doing a bunch of drugs um and like this is not a druggy movie per se but i feel like it is carried by that energy where john Boyega's character is so exhausted and tired of trying to do the right thing and he is seeing the seams in everything around him and I kind of felt like that whole framing device worked. Granting, I could not care less about the idea of a singularity or the countdown. But every other element that was hinting at, like, the moment or whatever, I'm totally fine with. Like, I, I just, like, breezed over. Tim Blake Nelson, to me, is just, like, he has the druggy neighbor. And this is just one of the many, like, things that is influencing his state of mind, you know? My, 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 my quote, favorite part, and, and I put that in quotes because it's, like, the part where like I just threw up my hands in the air is when he's like, you know what a singularity is? Not that kind of singularity. This is a different singularity. I was like, come mm. on, really? <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I just found this film frustrating, but mm. there's moments of fun in it, right? It is a, it is a silly heist movie with people doing weird stuff. I just and also Kyle Mooney's in it for some reason. <laughs> Yeah, as, as like a the, the head of like a Jewish. Is, is he the golem? I don't remember. <laughs> I I don't. He, he's definitely in charge of something. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. it's, but yeah, it was it was like. Uh. Yeah, yeah. Wow, interesting. I thought I was going to be harder on this movie than you because there were a few like criticisms I have. Like, I definitely think it is messy. Me messy is the word. I I think the. The benefit of the movie is exactly what the word you used, which is swagger. I think the movie has so much swagger that it kind of carries you through its messier scenes. I, for all the energy Bill Skarsgård slash Pennywise gives to it, I, did, <laughs> I didn't understand what he was doing in the movie. He really felt like he was in another movie, and every time he entered, like the tone really changed. Um, until the final like 25 minutes and then i was like hell yeah whatever the hell they're doing like just keep it going <laughs> the, the other thing too is like he is presented as though like until he starts saying like yeah we should steal this money i assume that he was just a regular lawyer not a public defender because he always seems fine right like when we meet him mm -hmm. he's not like john boyega is constantly like 
shit, I barely made it to this room. And then the judge fucked over my client. And then this sucks. And I'm doing all this stuff. And this is really, really hard. And I need to figure out how to get a place to stay at tonight. Yeah, I, I think he is like a guy who occasionally does pro bono or has found a way to like not really be a public defender. I think that's kind of the implication is he okay. has fallen into the moneyed world and he kind of lobs the public defender type things on to John Boyega whenever he can. Gotcha. Because yeah, there's definitely a they have different goals, we'll say, of what to do if right. they're able to acquire some money. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's For that's sure. a thing that we, we'll talk about. It's spoilers. <laughs> mm -hmm. One thing that is interesting to me is I looked on IMDb. I wanted to see what the uh, synopsis was. And it is when a successful New York public defender loses his first case, his life begins to unravel. I don't think the movie... Maybe I'm dumb. I don't think the movie made it seem like he was losing his first case. I feel like well, the movie did not communicate that to me at all. I mean, his first case he lost because, like, he tried to do a gambit where he pretended like his client spoke English. And when the judge realized that he didn't, he basically said, all right, throwing the book at him because you tried to pass him over as, like, understanding my right. question. Sure, I just didn't know in the text of the film that was the first case he has ever lost as a public defender. Oh, like, I yeah. somehow missed that if that was part of the narrative. Yeah. I, I kind of felt like he's a guy who has been fighting uphill his whole life, and like that this was just the breaking point. Yeah, it, it definitely didn't feel like that was the first time he's ever stood in the courtroom as a public defender. Um, but mm. just another example of <laughs> how this film is missing a few a few beats in it. But man, I had, I, I really enjoy when it becomes like a crimey type movie. I also like just the kind of hot New York evenings. Like, like there are moments where people are walking around like in a blackout, for instance. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I just like the vibe. I like the vibe of it a lot. I like the, the really big dude that uh, Ed Screen has near him. Um, <laughs> I, like, like there were fun things about this movie. Um, I was trying to figure out why I wanted the Craig character to like sprout robot arms for a while. It took me a while to place where I had seen him before. <laughs> Wait, what? Alita Battle Angel is the answer. Oh, <laughs> that's right. There you go. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. The, the, the energy in the cast just, just won me over. And I think it's kind of like ruminating in ideas about how completely broken the justice system is. And it has a kind of... I think the reason Sorry to Bother You came to mind for me is it definitely has a little bit of like an anarchic streak to it. And it's like layering on this idea of like, let's tear it all down with very funny and very entertaining visual. Like to be clear, I think Sorry to Bother You is a much better movie than this. Um, but yep. they, they feel like they're in a similar mold to me. Cool. Well, most of what I want to say about this film exists in spoilers. <laughs> so should we get sure. the verdicts for now for people who aren't gonna wait around to see this movie yeah all right steven miller if you're gonna give us a must see reckon with the caveat wait for rental pass with the caveat or a must avoid what would you give it i'm going recommend with a caveat with a much more higher variance than i normally would like i think you might have a great time watching this movie or you might be very frustrated because i think this is like a brazenly messy film where the script definitely could use some tightening up it is tracking a few too many threads. As you mentioned, it doesn't really know what genre it wants to play in. And from scene to scene, there can be some whiplash if you are trying to actually follow it as a like straightforward movie. But I think as a sandbox to play in as an, and as like a showcase for a cast that are just like giving it their all, I, I had a lot of fun with this movie. And I think it, it, it aims higher. Like it, it, it is a big swing and whether that swing is a miss or not is kind of up to you. But like, I appreciate that it went for it. And I feel like a lot of movies tone it down. And this definitely had the kind of hectic chaotic energy that I don't see enough of when we're doing these festival things. And it kind of brought me, brought me joy for that reason. Well, if, if I'm, if I'm calling things for this game, Steven, I'm going to give it a strike <laughs> because mm. for me, it was a swing and a miss. Um, <sighs> I mean, you know, it's always hard to talk about, like, if I would have seen this in the, in the middle of, like, the 15 films that I watched back to back for one of the other festivals, it might have been like, oh, that was a breath of fresh air, right? Like, that, like maybe it would have been something that stood out as, as, like, something kind of exciting or something like that. But for me, 
in this when we're dipping our toe in this one festival and we just watched two films i definitely when the film ended i kind of was like man i did not think that movie was good and it kind of just made me really really hope that the dry (laughs) was going to come around and give me one thing at the festival that i liked so whether it's mean or not i'm going to give this a pass with a caveat um because for me I would much rather watch something like Suicide Kings, which I know this film is not trying to be, but it's the thing that came to my mind when I thought about the the mix of flavors and stuff that that was doing in this um, in in this film. So, so that's my review. Pass the caveat. <laughs> um, sad. Yeah. Was that was there more to that or just just sad? Oh, I, I was just going to reiterate, because I didn't know if this would be the time or not, that I do think anyone listening should watch this and Red, White, and Blue, like, in succession, because I think there are a lot of interesting similarities and vast differences, and it it's just kind of fun to, uh, to think about them together. Yeah. All right. Um, well, for those who don't want to stick around for spoilers, we're going to close the episode out for you, and then we're going to take a little break before the spoilers. But uh, for now, Stephen Miller, if people want to find you throughout the week, where can they do that? Uh, people can find me at twitter.com slash sdavidmiller or sdavidmiller.com. People can find me at christopherinreallife.com or twitter.com slash christopherirl. You can find the podcast over at thespoilerwarning.com where you can get a bunch of the back episodes of the show. If you want to subscribe to the show, you can do so in Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, or wherever podcasts are found. If you want to know when the episodes go live, you can follow us at twitter.com slash spoilerwarning facebook.com slash the spoiler warning or instagram.com slash the spoiler warning if you want to get a hold of us directly you can send an email to fans at the spoiler warning.com or you can use the contact form on our site music for this episode will be the little jingle that plays before all the films this year at the the sf film festival and uh yeah that's it um that that jingle is playing right now that jingle is going to fade up and when the jingle fades out we'll be back in spoiler territory to talk about this film more fully All right, see you in a bit. All right, so we are back. This is spoiler territory. It is the full-blown spoiler after part of our review of Naked Singularity, and we are going to talk a little bit about um, this film, and I guess uh, I should probably started off since most of the things I didn't like about it um, are kind of spoilers for the film. And I think um, for, for, for me, I mean, obviously this film is called Naked Singularity. There are some aspects to like one scene in the middle where somebody talks about parallel dimensions and like different versions of yourself. And this film is all about somebody self-actualizing and deciding that if there's some version of him in some reality somewhere that does this thing that gets him what he wants, it should be him and he should decide to do it. And then at the end of the film, (laughs) all this culmination of this leading towards this collapse, which is this one moment where he stabs somebody with a samurai sword that he was given. No, that fucking that. Sorry. Sorry. Mid sentence. (laughs) my in the middle of my rant i realized you asked if this could possibly be his first case and it can't because he only has the samurai sword because oh, oh a no client i, I gave didn't it interpret him. it as his first case i the his synopsis first made it sound like he had never lost a case okay. until this moment and yeah. he seemed like a guy who like had to deal with losing cases all the time okay anyway sorry i just derailed in my rant <laughs> just because i was <laughs> mad about the samurai sword but anyway so so the whole thing is like hey this thing is leading to this moment. In the moment, you got to decide whether you want to be the guy who stays in the car or the guy who runs in with your samurai, or samurai sword, sp- stabs the bad guy, and then gets the money. And he decides to be the guy who does the thing. And then at the end of the movie, they say, man, I feel sorry for the guys, the other versions of us and the other realities that didn't do the thing. And then the other, <laughs> Bill Skarsgård goes, fuck those versions of us, <laughs> or whatever the line is. And I... Uh, it. it but yeah, just that whole framing of everything was, it was annoying to me because it wasn't like a real thing that was going to lead to anything. It's, it, so like, for instance, a film that I love is a little film called Another Earth, um, which for anybody who hasn't seen it, basically one day a literal other Earth appears in, I guess, locked synchronous orbit with our Earth and 
they try to make contact with it, and that's when they realize that it, it is, in fact, Earth, the president of the U.S., here is still the president there and that like they basically can can determine that like yeah a copy of all of us exists on this other earth and what this film posits is if there's another version of me out there did the other version of me make all of the same mistakes that i made make all the same to like did it did it succeed in all the ways i've succeeded did it fail in all the ways i've i've failed could it undo things that i have regret about like it's it's kind of positing that and it, it's a film about just about that idea. This film kind of wants to be that, but instead it just posits that there's a million other versions of you and then you should just decide which, like, I don't think that's the way alternate realities work <laughs> where you just decide you're going to be the one that wins <laughs> and then you win. Like, I don't know, something about the entire framing of it. Like, this is not <laughs> a freaking, what's the freaking Hulu show? Dance. Uh, Dev, yeah, this is not devs, yeah. right? <laughs> no, this is definitely not devs. I would just posit this has no desire to be devs. And I, I know, think... so why do it at all? <laughs> well, like I think the 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 metaphor here, which again, I do think this movie has characters yelling the meaning of metaphors at each other. Like that that is a weakness of the script, I think. But yeah. I think the metaphor here, which would have been better if it were a little more in the background and didn't need it to be like explained all the time, is very much the system is rigged, you know, 99.9% there, like, there's no chance of getting out of this life, right? Like you're fucked, whatever you do, you can fight against the system in a thousand different ways. It isn't going to work. And then they see this moment. Like, honestly, I think singularity is not the best physics analogy to use. It would really be like an electro, like quantum tunneling, like an electron jumping, like occasionally, a thing can just jump into another like level, like a, an, another stratosphere from where it was before. And they're, they're trying to make the impossible happen and like change their station and tip the tables where like the have nots versus the haves have changed. And all of this physics stuff is just like the temperatures rising, the particles are getting antsier unpredictable things are going to happen and eventually this is going to bubble over. And this is like one moment of it bubbling over and one instance where like a little, you know, the, the boiling water, like a little splash went up way further than it was expected to and got in the eye of like, you know, like, like that is the kind of area that I feel like it is playing with. And many universes, it's just like, you know, in most universes we totally fail, but in one we succeed, let's do it. Um, and that, I think, is the only degree to which this movie cares about any kind of, like, analogy to quit physics or alternate universes or anything. And I don't feel like, other than the fact that it made the name be Naked Singularity, I don't think it leans into it that hard either. It's mostly, like, the the physics-y things of, like, shit is going down, the world doesn't make sense anymore, something has to give, and then this is the thing that gives, you know? Like, if, if this was him, if this film was him and his buddy sitting at a bar and he was reading a book, physics book, an anything book. He was scrolling through Twitter on his phone and was like, oh my God, check out, this, this, doesn't this sound interesting? And said the whole scene that he has with Tim Blake Nelson and, and just read that in, in real time and was like, huh, that's interesting. And then kept thinking it over as the film was going on and then said like, in a world where this thing that I just learned happened, like if that was all it was, it wouldn't bother me as much, but framing the film as X amount of time till the collapse, X amount of time till the collapse, X amount of time till the collapse, having little moments of time where the universe shakes and he sort of goes into his own world for a second and like things ripple and clocks are rearranging themselves and the temperature of the city is changing and nobody else notices but him. Like cluing him into that is like, no, don't try to make this a sci-fi film because it's not a sci-fi film. And I know that you'll say it's not trying to be a sci-fi film, but what you're right. doing is throwing in these tropes of something that is more important than what the film is that you're actually doing. And like, for me, just none of that worked. Cause I was like, what are you doing? Like, I knew it wasn't going to go anywhere. I was like, there's no way this will pan out. Like the collapse won't be anything like it, the collapse is your, uh, um, shyness or your lack of motivation that collapses and suddenly you can self-actualize and do something for once like that's that's the real change but that's the thing is he's not a timid shy guy like he he like quips with the, with the judge right like he actually right. throws no, things I, I back that, in their face collapse 
is his like belief in the system, like in the belief that like following doing things by the book will get him what he wants. And in this moment, he has done a complete about face and decided that like the only way to really make a dent here is to like violate like what I thought I had to be before. Like I'm but going to stab a guy with a sword. I'm going to rob from drug dealers and they're like, but, but like Steven, I think that is the collapse. It's not like him being a timid person and suddenly having like, you know, motivation. But, but he makes he makes that decision. The collapse happens when he's already in a car outside the drug dealer's place with a samurai sword in his hand and his buddy has a grenade launcher. Like you have made that decision already. Like if I if you and I got into a car and drove outside of some drug dealer's house and you had a grenade launcher and I had a samurai sword and then the cops pulled up and we were outside, there's no way that we're not in trouble for like about to go in and like, right? Like you've already made, you've already become an accomplice in this crime. Like that, that is intent to rob somebody at sword point, right? <laughs> right. But I think, so I think again, the singularity metaphor, which is not all that bulletproof, I'll, I'll grant you. But <laughs> like when I think of singularity, I think of an asymptote, like, like a graph that just keeps going up, 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 like it's approaching a thing. And so you being upset that he's already approaching it, I think misses the point. The point is the moment he does this and suddenly a public defender has like millions and millions of dollars to pay for bail for people and they are going to win their cases. And like, he's finally gotten out of the rut and found a way that like, they can keep winning and winning will be get more winning. I but, think that is like the thing that is the acceleration. And like the moment I will, it, m my edit for the movie, take away the countdown, a hundred percent, take away the countdown. Don't make it be one moment you're counting down to. It doesn't matter. It doesn't help. Keep all the other interstitial elements where weird things are happening because it's fine. Like, like I'm fine with that. But I don't think there is the moment in time. Yeah, yeah. But basically, I don't, I don't buy the one moment. I think the point is that it is an acceleration that will beget more acceleration, and that is what he's done. Is like they've leapt into a place where he is eternally out of the station that he was in, and he can bring other people up with him. So, so let me back up a little bit on something that you said because. Another thing that really made me mad at the end of the film is something that you said, like you, like, I don't know, I don't know that you were backing up the film, but basically you were saying that like him having $5 million, which is one third of the $15 million that collectively that group had gotten from this job that they pulled, um, showed that he was going to win cases. But mm. all it does is allow him to pay for the bail of the people that he is publicly defending, right? There right. is, th there is... There is nothing about the system that has changed other than the extra piece of the system, which also fucks people over by putting them in jail until their court date. Right. So there is no there's nothing about the fact that 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 judge hates him and the fact that like he's still looked down upon by that judge that is going to change his outcome other than the fact that he can make sure that they don't have to sit in jail while they're waiting for their, their trial. No, I think the the big idea is that. The bail system means people are faced between sitting in jail or taking a plea bargain. And that the fact is that like cases almost never go to court. And the fact that they almost never go to court is the problem. Like that is one of the big reasons the system is rigged is he can't even like I think the guy who doesn't speak English in the beginning of the movie, he is trying to get the guy to go along with a plan to like, you're going to win. Let's like let this play out. And, but then, like, the fact that he couldn't meant that he's, like, keeping the plea gar bargain that he would have had before, which is, like, a guilty plea for, like, a not terrible amount of time, but is still, like, a loss. Like, I, I think in general, that is what the public defender rails against, is the fact that, like, these things don't even get to be litigated. They get, you know, they get thrown in jail. There's a bail they can't pay. It's a choice between staying in jail for an unknown amount of time or take a plea deal, people take a plea deal, and then all you get to do is be a sentencing, trying to, like, lessen the sentence in the end. And now he can take them to court, and that is where justice can maybe prevail. I don't think the movie backs it up that much, but I 100% think that is, like, the idea for, for him. I, I'm, all, I'm all fine with that. Like, I'm fine with the idea that, like, you're solving half of the problem by having them not have to take a plea deal. But, like, you haven't shown us that you can win anything. <laughs> 
right? And you, what you have shown us is that this judge hates you. And apparently it's the only ever, judge you ever get like this. Like it'd be one thing if, if the, the montage at the beginning of the film was him looking like trying to defend different people in front of different judges, but it's only the one judge, which I guess that that courthouse only has a single judge and it's always in front of that judge that he has to try to go, go in front of. But I, I just felt like I was like, you haven't solved your problem with $5 million. All you've done is prolong the, the defeat. <laughs> And and it, it, just to me, it, it's like, it's not, yes, it's a piece of the puzzle that you're solving. But to me, it doesn't solve like the, like the system is still rigged. Like just because they didn't take a plea sure. deal doesn't mean that you're going to win. Sure. I just think that maybe I just watched the wire or two recently, but I think like sentencing equals one judge is God, whereas take it to trial means you need to actually convince the jury of someone's peers. And I think that becomes a very different scenario. And yeah. most people don't ever do it because it takes money. You need to pay lawyers usually. You need to, you know, you need to be willing to put up with a lot. Otherwise, the loss you face if you lose that is like even bigger. Yeah. Um, but I think I don't think the movie really justifies it. But I think the court scenes we see in this movie are primarily sentencing. Um, and in the end is him finally getting to shine. Gotcha. All right. Fine. I'll, I'll give you that, Stephen. I'll give you that. And then our justice system will work. <laughs> <laughs> there it is <laughs> um so let's get back to the heist itself so mm -hmm. steven can you explain to me what their plan was i know you already said that they didn't really have a plan but like can you explain what they thought their plan was yeah i mean their plan was to allow the bad guys, Craig, um, to get the car. The police couldn't track it anymore because they were going to swap out the trackers with their own trackers instead. Um, the bad guys were going to go to the Gollum, um, trade their drugs for cash. They were going to get there ba and basically like steal, take the money and then send the trackers to the police so they would bust the golem and get rid of the drugs. They were probably imagining that what was going to happen is the Craig or whatever was going to like drive in there, drop off the drugs, take the cash, and then drive somewhere else, and then they could ambush Craig. They probably weren't imagining that they were going to have to like go into a like firefight with all the drug dealers and everything <laughs> there too. Um, but I, I think that was the rough plan. It was basically a double, like a double cross, like you know. Let let them do the hard part and then swoop in and take the money and the police will be happy because they confiscated the drugs. Who? Why are they going to care if some like mob boss cries that he's owed cash, like fifteen million dollars in cash? Like they don't care. Um, and then they walk away. So I, I don't think they had a real exit strategy, but I think the movie even specifically says that, like, like that. There's not. There's even a line about like having an exit strategy. So, so I personally believe that you're doing some heavy lifting saying they probably assumed the guy was going to get the cash and go somewhere else and they can rob him there <laughs> because, mm. because if he's exchanged, if he's dropping off the vehicle that they have the tracker in, how do they track the guy who assuming is not going to leave in the same vehicle that he just dropped off for them? Right. So to me, they thought we'll go in blind to a a a drug dealing group whose boss is called the golem <laughs> right? yeah. like you don't get called the golem because you're kyle mooney but apparently you do <laughs> right like they had no idea what they were going into and they had a samurai sword and a grenade launcher and the grenade launcher was tear gas grenades not like not concussive grenades not explosive grenades it was tear gas grenades so right they thought we're just going to go in and just do this and everything will be fine and there won't be any problems. Turns out the drug dealers are just, you know, nice Hasidic Jews who are, you know, just they're not doing anything crazy. They're just in there counting money and that's it. Like they're, they're, they're not they're not heavily armed force. So it turned out to be OK for them. But are you kidding me? Like if these drug dealers are willing to pay. $15 million for something, you would think that they might have something to guard that $15 million to make sure, like, have you seen any movie where there's a handoff or drugs that happen? Like, I just, I couldn't believe how ridiculous this idea was 
that like, oh, no, things are fine. We'll just run in there with our sword and our grenade launcher and just take the money from everybody. And the only reason it works out is like basically by accident, right? Like there's not really a reason why this should have worked out. It just yeah. happens to work out for them. Um, like if it was any real drug dealers, right? Like anybody that like Walter White encountered, like they would have just died. <laughs> right. Right. So I, I'll, yeah, I'll concede I, that. Sure. <laughs> I just don't care. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just, it just, to me, it was like, so, like at this point I was like, what is your plan? Like, what are you doing? And then let's back up from that. The actual bad dude who, who, <laughs> who slept with the girl to get her to steal the car in the first place. Yeah. What was his plan? Cause so originally was he doing a drug dealer f deal for the real bad guys? And then the car got pinched and then he was going to try to steal it and sell it. But like, why did he think that the real people who owned the car weren't going to show up and bid on the car too? Like his, I, his whole plan seems stupid as hell. Like the fact that the, that the mm. actual bad guys show up and they're like, yeah, we're here to buy the car too, sucker. Like I was like, okay, nobody thought of this. Like in my head, he was working for those guys and he was getting the money back for those guys. And then he was getting right. a cut for like, as soon as it turned out that like, no, he's trying to double cross the guys who he was working for the first time when he lost the car. Like it just didn't, it didn't yeah. make sense to me. Yeah. I mean, he, he basically is, he's doing his own American dream, I guess. Yeah. Like, like he originally that was a deal on behalf of the cartel and the car got booked and he was told to basically get it out. And maybe, maybe the key ingredient here is the date change. Like maybe the date change was a specific thing that, uh, Olivia cook managed to do. And that was her trying to get away from the FBI and Craig trying to get away from his, you know, cartel overlords. So it was yeah. like each of them were basically trying to do a thing to like double cross. Um, but, but so, yeah. so the, que the question for me is, did he do the work to find out that this group of Jewish, this team of Jews would, would, would want to buy the drugs? Is that work that he found out on his own or was the cartel selling to them originally? Because if they were always selling to them and his idea was to steal the car before the people who were selling to them got it and then go through with the deal as planned and just keep the money. That just seems like a, another real, <laughs> real, real stupid idea. I, I mean, the, the other possibility is that the cartel were aware of the drugs, but this was like a theft of some sort. Like, I, I don't know. I, I don't totally know what Craig's deal is. Yeah. But hey, she swiped right. What, what can you do? <laughs> <laughs> that was like the worst decision in the movie to me. The moment she did, I was like, "What? You're gonna let, you're gonna let that guy in your apartment?" <laughs> but I mean, she was yeah, armed. She was prepared. That, that's the thing too. It's like when he, when he um, also uh, the chronology of that scene. So she swipes right. He texts her, "You up, babe? Where's your Where's your apartment?" They go there. They smash. <laughs> Then he's he's a he's a pro lizards in the earth guy like <laughs> yeah like, like uh, I guess it makes she just sense has why that face yeah but anyway so even if I can forgive that like apparently the script thought this was real real funny um, but he believes in lizard people um, but then it immediately cuts to her having been picked up pr for something unrelated or for the same job but like it's just weird to me that like. It almost makes it sound like that guy was a CI or something and had like for, for like for like all of 30 seconds. I was like, wait, was he an undercover cop? And he like she got picked up because he got her to agree to get the car. He, like, he was trying to get her to get the drugs out of the car and she got picked up for that. Like she had grabbed a little bit to prove that it was the right one. But and she got caught with the, with that. But the way they the way they edit edit it is they skip the scene where she actually does it. So she says, I'll help you get to the car. Smash cut to her being in jail and saying that, like, yeah, I got busted trying to get the car. But then it turns out there was a whole scene where she went to work and went in the back and unscrewed the shit from the car and then got, the got a sample of the drugs and went out and then got arrested later when they were going to show the sample of the drugs over there. But because it cuts from I'll help you get the drugs to boom, this conversation where she's like, you didn't know we had a guy in there. And it's like, wait, is the 
did, did she just fuck a CI? Like, is the, like, it made it seem weird. I was like, oh, okay, that's not what happened. But why did you choose to edit the film that way? I don't know. I also... I, I want to say there's a rule where a lawyer isn't supposed to have sex with the person they're defending, which is why uh, John Boyega is real lucky that he's no longer her lawyer. And I think the movie specifically made somebody like yell it at him right before he went to see her. Just so we would all remember, like he's not representing her anymore and this is fine. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> all right, Steven, I think I'm done yelling about this movie. <laughs> Okay. I can't I can't defend it. I don't want to try. I just thought it was fun. I was I was into it. I like the sandbox I was playing with a lot. I like the energy and I think it's cool. Cool. Um well I think that's gonna do it then for our review of Naked Singularity. We have one more review for you from SF Film, and that is of a little Australian film called The Dry. So see you in a bit. <laughs> 